Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Well, uh, before we get started, I want to let you know today's episode is brought to you by the financial support of our listeners. Thanks so much for your support. Uh, and I also want to let you know over at the uh, Great Detectives of Old Time Radio at greatdetectives.net, I have my review up of, uh, the, la- of one of the latest, uh, Father Brown Mysteries, uh, collections from Colonial Radio Theater. You can check that out at greatdetectives.net. Well, last week I could, uh, I looked all around and I had to conclude that the poker party, party killings, um, episode was either lost or so lost that I could not find it. So I went with the next week's episode instead. But I am very pleased that, um, well, I wasn't happy that I had the same situation happen this week, uh, getting an unexpected uh, misdirection. But I was happy that I was able to locate the actual copy of the Poker Party uh, Killings case. And so let's go ahead and take a listen. We're going back one week to October 1st of 1952, so let's take a listen. Ladies and gentlemen, we take you now behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is the lineup. Uh, yeah, over there. Second row came in about 15 minutes ago. Hmm. Anything happen? Well, they made Francisco's prints on the showcase and safe. If she identifies him, he can be arraigned in the morning without any trouble. How many tonight? Well, uh, 42. Huh? Yeah, and Masterson's been picking up narcotic suspects all day. You know, that thing on Temple Hill. Oh, yeah. You getting anywhere? Uh, broke it this afternoon, I guess. A couple of his men found an acre of marijuana growing next to a celery patch down for town. Hey, uh... How about those Dodgers today? Yeah, those homers really paid off. I'll see you later. Right. Pardon me. Pardon me, please. Thank you. Ah, oh, hello, Shirley. Oh, hi. Sit down, sit down. Well, thanks. Tom told me to sit here. Said you'd be along pretty soon to take care of me. Tom? The Sergeant Quine, you know. Oh, Sergeant Quine. <laughs> yeah. And here you are, huh? Uh-huh. Now, Shirley, if you see anybody in the line you recognize Oh, didn't tonight, you get I... it? Didn't you arrest the one I saw in the picture? Well, we want you to identify the man you saw breaking into the store, if you can. I picked out his picture, didn't I? That's right. Now we want you to identify him in person. It's the way we make sure on these things. Oh. Hey. Hmm? I know him, don't I? You're Sergeant Carger? Pete. <laughs> yeah, Pete. May I have your attention, please? Oh, he's so businesslike. You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Cogger, Sergeant Pete Cogger. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name, and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him held. The officers who took your name will assist you. They're seated among you. Please be prompt with your questions or identifications. When the prisoners I've leave here, they're sent like to the washroom and dressed mm-hmm. back into the jail. It's exciting, you know, for a girl Makes like it me. It's quite difficult mm-hmm. to bring them you know? back after they leave yeah. here. Yeah. Now, the questions I ask How long have you been a policeman? Really to get a natural tone of voice. Oh, 13 years. Much attention well, that's a long time, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. All right, bring on the line. All the way to the end of the stage, boys. Over here, all the way to the end. That's right. 
I'll turn and face the screen. There he is. Mm. Hands out the tall pocket, one. That's the man I saw in the picture. That's Same the one who broke into the store. You're certain? Yes. All right, number one. Okay, Clarence Daly, let's wait until he's questioned. Merchandise. Up to the white line, Clarence. Where do you live? Uh, seven times seven. Speak right up, Clarence. It's a long way to the back of the room. Once more. Uh, 727 Patriarch Street. What's your occupation, Clarence? I work in a liquor store. Sell liquor. Hapman's. Hapman's? Well, Hapman's Liquor. Sober on 4th That where you were arrested, Clarence? Yes. Anyone arrested with you? No. Well, I was all right. Look straight ahead of you, Clarence. Don't look at me. You own a gun? No. Automobile? No, not anymore. I had a board in the last month. Okay, Clarence, step back. I didn't get that, Sergeant. Step back against the wall, Clarence. Oh, I, I didn't understand that. Number two, Joseph Francisco, burglary. Okay, Joe. Okay, what? On the line, Joe. What's your address? You hear me? I'm trying to think. Call the, uh, Raven Support Hotel, someplace on Marshall Street. You new in town? That's right. Where you from? Bonneville, Missouri. When'd you get here? Last week. Uh, Thursday, I guess. No, it's Friday. Are you sure about that? Oh, yeah, I yeah, I'm lying. Sure about what? But the store oh, was right. Up straight, Joe. Down. Well, that's more like it. Just let your hands hang at your sides. Yeah. You own a car. That's him. Yeah. What kind? What color? What right. happens now? Well, at the end of the line, we'll hold him out for interrogation. Oh. Anyone with you when you're arrested, Joe? I was with a girl. What's her name? I don't know. It's just some girl I met. I'm having a beer when Big John Bull walked in. Sure could use that beer now. Yeah. Well, step back. Lieutenant. Hmm? Number you three, mean? Robert Ainsworth. No, I'm not. Vagrancy. Oh. Uh, step up to the circle, Robert. I, um... Uh... Yeah? Thanks, Robert. Where do you live, Robert? Only take a minute. It's all right. I got plenty of time. I'd like to have you sign this verification card. Oh, sure. Yeah. Thanks. Well, what'll happen now? I'll ask Francisco for a statement. You mean you'll ask him to confess? No, much to that. Huh. It's not for him. Suppose he don't want to confess. <laughs> I think he understands. We have him pretty cold on these burglaries he's been pulling. If he makes a statement, he'll get a quicker hearing. I might be calling you back in a few days to appear. In court? Well, sort of. Magistrate's court. Uh, that's when the complaint will be presented. Oh. Well, thanks for coming down. Really appreciate it. I'm glad to do it. Well, hello, Pete. Oh, hello. How are you? I'm fine. A hot shot called, Ben. Uh, what's up? Double murder. When? Ten minutes ago. Quine's out there now. I'll see you in the garage. All right. Bye. Oh, yeah. So long. Well, goodbye. Goodbye, Shirley. <laughs> Stop it in here. Some party. Yeah. Well, who are they? Well, that one's Anthony Avrilla. This one's Vincent Diacino. You find a knife? No, I had some men look around outside. Thought I'd wait in here till the coroner's finished. Yeah. Any witnesses? Lots of them. The man who lives next door, Edward Papelli, says there was a poker game here tonight. Now, who identified him? Papelli. He's known Avrilla for years. Diacino, about two months. This is Avrilla's room. Landlady says he rented it about a year ago. Okay. Now, where's she? Downstairs. Uh, take it here, Pete. Yeah. Come on. Be right, then. All right. Oh, terrible day. Is that her? Yeah, that's her. Terrible. Uh, Mrs. Kanapka, this is Lieutenant Guthrie. Oh, the terrible king. Such nice boys, all of them. Such nice, nice boys. Playing cards and living and poking. I uh, understand Anthony Havrill has lived here for a year. Is that right, Mrs. Kanapka? Yes. Yes, that is. You've known him all that time? Oh, yes. Poor Anthony. Uh, the other victim, Vincent Iacchino. You know him, too? <laughs> Friend of Anthony's. I know this. Anthony, little friend. They work together. Where? I do not know. 
Do you know where Iachino lives? Yes. Yes, he lives in Gorman. Well, ten minutes ago, you didn't remember that, Mrs. Kanafka. Now I do. Uh, how about the others who were here? Did you see them? Yes. I see. Well, did you know them? No. Any of them at all? Oh, I have seen them here before, but I do not know them. Uh, how many were there? No. No, I do not know. Well, uh, did you hear anything unusual tonight? Nothing. Not the word. Peaceful. I was sitting, reading my paper. No loud voices from up there? Oh, no, no. Any sounds of a struggle? Struggle? Oh, no. Only laughing and talking. I saw them come here to poor Anthony's room. They passed by right there in the hall, you see. Well, what, to, uh, to go up the stairs? Yes, yeah, to go up the stairs. I said to them, be gentlemen, be quietly. There are others. Mr. Lexman across the hall sick. Mm -hmm. Well, go on, Mrs. Knappen. They were quiet. For boys, they were quiet. I mean, I... Oh, loud laugh, maybe. Maybe a word, not too nice, but gentlemen. Uh -huh. Mrs. Knappke, you've seen that room up there? Oh, sure. There was some sure. furniture broken. One of the windows smashed. The bottle broken. Huh? A broken furniture and glass. Looks like there might have been quite a fight up there, Mrs. Knappke. Oh, yes. Well? Yes. What did you know about the fight? Oh, there was fighting. I heard that. Oh. About an hour ago. I hear them rush downstairs fast. Then all is quiet. I wait a moment. Then I go up to Anthony's room to see what... Terrible, terrible. Oh, terrible. Oh, terrible. I uh, know this has been a lot for you, Mrs. Kanopka, but I, I wish you'd do your best to cooperate with oh, us. I tell everything. Nothing to hide. Well... Did you say anything to them when they came down the stairs? Oh, no, no. Ben. Who is this? A uh, police officer, Mrs. Knopf. Uh, coroner's waiting for me. Okay. Uh, keep on here, Clint. Yeah, Ben. You come back. Yeah, yeah. Thinks it might have been a screwdriver instead of a knife. Oh? Gonna post them tomorrow. Uh, you talked to Laxman, man who lives in that one? Yeah. He says he knew Havrilla and Iachino. Told me a man named Charles Bender, another one named Bob Fisher were in the card game tonight. Might be a break. Huh? Yeah, I phoned in. R and I got a make for me. Fisher did two years for car theft. Out last November. Five arrests previous to that. Burglary, theft, nothing big. Benders had 13 arrests, two convictions. Both narcotics. Six months county jail, 1939. Six months county jail, 1946. Okay, check them out. Now we need at least one more. Huh? Takes five men for a poker game. <laughs> Ben. Morning. Anything new? Uh, Francisco made a statement. Mm. Clears up about 27 burglary jobs. And your friend uh, Shirley Madden called twice. Oh, what'd she want? You. <laughs> you can get the package together on Francisco. Send over to the district attorney's office. Right. Pete, in you? Hey, he's in your office. Uh, Bender turned himself in this morning. Yeah? yeah I walked in the fifth precinct, told the desk sergeant he thought he was wanted. They just brought him down. Okay. Anything on the others? Watching their houses, checking their mama sheets. Okay. What'll I tell Shirley if she calls again? Oh, say I'll see her at the trial. Want to smoke, Ben? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Oh, hi, Ben. This is, uh, this is Charlie Bender. Oh, hello, son. Hello, Lieutenant. I understand you turned yourself in. Yes, sir. I didn't want any part of this. No part of it at all. He was just about to tell us what happened last night. Well, go ahead. Oh, I, I don't know how it started. I really don't. We've been drinking some, but nobody was drunk. Now, who was there? Well, uh, Varela, Iachino, then a kid named Fisher, and this new kid that Tony invited. Now, what was his name? Tony just called him Pinky. He was already there when Fisher and me come in. Uh, sitting there with Tony and Vince. Mm-hmm. They just called him Pinky, and we sat down to play. You don't know his full name? No, no. And I had nothing to do with it. It was Pinky. He was the one. You mean he did the killing? Yeah, yeah. You don't know any more about him other than that they called him Pinky? No. Go on. Well, we were playing five card. Me and Fisher dropped out after the openers. Pinky and Vince and Tony played it out. Uh, Tony won the hand. And Pinky got mad about it, said he'd been sandbagging. Began calling Tony names, kept kneeling him. Pinky dealt the next hand, lost that too. He blamed Vince for it. Then he started swinging him. Vince went after him. Pinky picked up a screwdriver sitting on a windowsill and went right in his chest. 
We all got scared. Tony tried to get his arms around Pinky, and Pinky let him have it, too. I guess you saw where. That's about the way it happened. Why'd you run, Charlie? Pinky looked at me and Fisher and said we'd better get out of there before somebody called a cops. He said we were all in it together. Did he threaten you? He still had the screwdriver in his hand. Did he threaten you? Did he say he'd kill you if you didn't go with him? He just killed two guys. He had the screwdriver in his hand. Did he threaten Fisher? No. No, he just said we'd all be hauled in if we didn't get out of there. You never liked this thing, went out. Huh. Yeah. Thanks. Look, uh, don't you guys believe me? Just trying to get all the facts. Well, I'm telling them to you. What happened after you left the house? You all piled in Fisher's car, started driving. Pinky said we headed for Chicago. Fisher didn't want to, but Pinky kept talking. Crazy, kind of. Fisher said, okay, we do that. Pinky said he had a gun at his place. He wanted to stop, pick it up, so Fisher drove him over there. And what? Where was that? Uh, uh, C- Clover Street, I think. He went in, come right out. He had a gun with him. What kind? I don't know, just a gun. All right, then what happened? Fisher said he wanted to get some things at his place, so he drove over there. But there was a prowl car out in front when we went by, so he just kept on going. That's, that's really what started me thinking. I knew we were in for it real good. Fisher and me didn't have anything to do with it, but they already wanted us. They knew who we were. I, I, I just took a chance when we stopped for a light on Federal. I piled out a car, began running Pinky yelled at me, but I just kept on going. I ran an alley and climbed a fence, and I hid in a filling station. It was closed for the night. I just stayed there till I thought it was safe, and then, then I found a nearest police station. Hmm. The whole thing started when Vincent Iacchino won a hand from Pinky. Yeah, that's right. Pinky went after Vincent with a screwdriver, and then he got Tony. Uh-huh. All over that one hand? Yeah, yeah. How much money did Pinky lose on that hand, Charlie? Nineteen cents. Both back this Sunday night, Edgar Bergen and Company and Eve Arden as our Miss Brooks. Yes, it's the Bergen and McCarthy Show with Mortimer Snurd, Ray Noble's Orchestra, and guest stars. Back Sunday nights at the Star's Address, starting this weekend. Returning the same night is Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden as an English teacher ever seeking her special degree in romance. For comedy galore, enjoy Bergen and McCarthy and Our Miss Brooks on most of these same stations back this Sunday night, presented by CBS Radio. <laughs> You said it was a white house. Yeah, yeah, it was a white house. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was a white house. On Clover Street. Yeah, yeah, look, I'm doing my best. We've gone up and down three times now, Bender. 32nd to 25th. You said it was here someplace? It is, it is. Uh, Could we try the alley here? He took us in through the alley. Okay, Pete, back it up. Uh, I, I, I sure want you to get a line on him. You know that, don't you? You know I want you to get him. Yeah, sure, Bender. Almost six. Is it? I'm getting hungry. Yeah, me too. Hey. You spotted? Oh, we turned left in the alley just like we did into this one. He made Fisher stop the car right by a big garage. Then he went into the house while we waited. He... Hey, look, this could be it. All right, take a good look, Bender. I, I think this is the place. It was dark, but I remember there was a high fence and he went through a gate like that one. Okay, Pete. Give it a try. Yep. Be right back. All right. You said you didn't have a chance to talk to Fisher? I, I didn't, bro. Well, what about when you were waiting in the car for Pinky? What did you talk about then? Well, You were I... all alone? Pinky wasn't around? We, we were scared more than anything else. A crazy guy just killed two people. We were scared, that's all. We just going to play a little penny ante last night. That's all. But you could have gotten away from him then. Yeah, yeah, we could have, but we were scared. Uh-huh. Look, that's the truth. Me and Fisher didn't have anything to do with the killing. It was all Pinky. That's true, honestly. That's true. Yeah? A man named Harrison owns the house. 
He's putting on some clothes right now. Three days ago, he rented the back room to a guy who gave his name as Lloyd Talbot. Tall, red-headed, medium build, about 27. Mm. Well, Bender? Hey, I never heard that name, but it sure sounds like him. Harrison got a phone in there? Yeah. Now, take it here, Pete. I'll send somebody out from the crime lab. Right, Ben. Uh, call in that name. We might have something. Yeah. Sure, pretty morning, huh? Yeah. Fine. You're right, Charlie. Yeah. yeah. Now, lady, yeah. you want the juvenile division. Yeah, just sit down on the bench. Five. Uh, hold on. Okay. Uh, this goes 305. Hi. Oh, hi. Oh, no, I haven't got a thing on a Lloyd Talbot, Ben. Oh, well, Monica Files still our best bet, Ben. Asher brought up his batch a couple of minutes ago. Got some mugs for him to look mm-hmm. at. How many are there? 325. Hey, look, don't I get any sleep? After you look at these. Come on. <sighs> Murph and Crockett found a screwdriver. It was in some bushes in front of the house. Lab said the blood samples the same type as those of the Achino and Avrilla. Any prints? One good thumbprint being checked now. Now, let me know. Okay. Okay, Charlie, make yourself comfortable. Yeah, yeah. Hey, do I have to look at all these? I don't know. What? He might be this first boy. No. No? How about this one? No. Hmm? No. Hmm? No, no, look, I'm hungry, I'm tired. You want to smoke? Yeah. Thanks. Well, how about this one? No. Here. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's... They found a car, Ben. Huh? Motorcycle officer on Federal Highway spotted it. Fisher's in it, shot to death. Let's go. My bike started to go haywire about there. I pulled over to the side of the road to have a look. I saw it sticking out in those trees. Yeah. Must have rolled it down from up there. Uh, tracks across the shoulder of the road. All this brush broken around here. Yeah. Uh, what time did you come on, Nevers? Uh, six o'clock this morning, sir. Figure it must have happened before sunrise, because there are a lot of trucks on the highway early in the morning. Uh-huh. Pretty busy. And he needed a minute or two to get out of the car and push it over. Yeah. It's at about four hours, Ben. Oh, then make it around uh, two or three this morning, huh? Yeah. Oh. What? That burrs all over the place. Yeah. Uh, this patrolman Nevers, he spotted the car, Sergeant Quine. Oh, Nevers. Oh, Sergeant. We wanted roped off from about there to there, over to there. Yeah. Soft ground around here might be a footprint somewhere that'll help. Uh, cover the shoulder of this road on both sides. He might still be around. Lots of cafes and roadhouses up the road, sir. Motels and places he could stay. A walking distance? Oh, five, six miles, maybe, yeah. Yeah, we better cover all those, Quinn. Right. Uh, where'd you call from, Nevers? Uh, filling station, half a mile down. How much longer the coroner going to be? Uh, another hour or so. Uh, oh, here's Pete. Yeah. This came from the office, Ben. Gotta make on Pinky. Oh, Ben, to find him? Uh-uh. On that thumbprint, name is Lester Richard Thompson. Hmm. What was he up for? Auto theft in 1943, burglary conviction 1951. Small-time stuff, cheap crook. Oh, uh, what about this here? Uh, looks like he killed Fisher in the car, then pushed it over the side and took off. Hmm. Lester Richard Thompson, eh? Yeah. He's growing up. Still cheap. Huh? He's killed three men for nothing. Anything new? Yeah, a couple of things. Place out on Federal Highway, about 18 miles from where the car was found, called the Hi-Hat. Mm-hmm. Asher covered the place with Murph and Ollinger. The waitress there, name of Vicki Walters, remembered a man who came in the restaurant about 10 or 11 this morning. She said he had mud all over his shoes, looked tired, a little scared. He had some coffee, made a phone call. Taxi came out, picked him up. Did she see the mug on Thompson? Yeah, she wasn't too sure it was the same man, but Asher's checking it out now. Black and tan, cab company. Take a while to go through those waybills. Yeah. You got any sleep at all? No, not much. 
Too hot. Yeah. Pete, go home? No, he went over with Asher. Oh, uh, these came in from the lab. Mm-hmm. Fisher got it with a 38. No. Ballistics working on the slugs now. You post over? Yeah. Report ought to be up pretty soon. Found four good prints of Thompson's in the car. Well, he's our boy. Yeah. Oh, I would made him do it all, all of a sudden. Like, uh, you suppose it's a heat, then? When we get him, I'll ask him. Investigation, Sergeant Quine. Yeah. Well, what's the number? 315, right. That's Asher, cab driver, identified Thompson's mug. Where'd he take him? Newport Hotel, 315 Bailey. Checked in under the name of Lawrence Tyler. He's on the second floor, room 215. Ash is covering the stairs in the back. Okay. You want to take it here, Quine? Right. You alone? Yeah. Oh, uh, this is Mr. Compton. He's the clerk here. Lieutenant Guthrie. Hello, Mr. Compton. Oh, how are you? Well, I was just telling this officer here. I uh, checked him in about, oh, let me see. Well, it was about 11 o'clock. He didn't have any luggage, but he did pay in advance, and so I thought... Uh, I said, tell me, uh, did you get any phone calls, or... Has he made any since he's been here? Oh, no, 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 no. He just went up to his room, and he's been there ever since. You sure, Mr. Compton? <laughs> well, he'd have to pass this desk to get out unless he went out the fire escape. I see. You got a key, Pete? Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, you won't, uh... I mean, there won't be any ruckus. I hope not, Mr. Compton. Well, anything I can do to help. Well, but I mean... uh, just stay here. Thanks. to the right, Ben. Yeah. Mm. Quiet. Yeah. Let's not give him any chances. Open it. Yeah. All right, Thompson. You're covered. Uh, hey, what is this? What's the idea of busting a guy's room when he's sleeping? Police officers. Get on your feet and get some clothes on. We want you downtown. Hey, I... Well, ben, watch him. All right, boy. All right. Come on now. Be sensible. Kill you. I'll kill all of you. Okay, Pete. Hey, you hear me? I'll kill you. Hmm. Tough guy. Yeah. Cheap tough guy. Lineup, where before you pass the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. Listen again next week when we again bring you the lineup. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Cogger, Sergeant Pete Cogger. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call the number. The lineup, starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie with Jack Moyles as Sergeant Pete Carger, was written by E. Jack Newman with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were High Everback, Virginia Gregg, Howard McNear, Lou Krugman, Anthony Barrett, and Larry Thor. The lineup is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. CBS Radio brings you every kind of show. Pleasure for everyone, wonderful hours of fun, turn your dial for a smile, entertainment all the while, you'll hear the best wherever you go, just tune to CBS Radio. CBS Radio. And remember, for music and songs of Tin Pan Alley, join Von Monroe on Saturday nights.
Network. Welcome back. Um, uh, just a, a pretty solid episode. Just a great procedural. I love the twist, and uh, I love the bit of humor at the beginning. Only thing in that uh, episode that didn't work is just that kind of awkward conversation at the, about the Dodgers at the beginning. But I love the little bit with the... Uh, uh, witness having a crush on Guthrie. And then, uh, investigation worked in just quite a wide variety of, uh, characters. So I was glad that I found this and was able to bring it to you. All right. Well, that will do it for today. We will be back on Monday with, uh, yours truly, Johnny Dollar, as we get into our pre-Christmas shows. And, uh, then we'll be back here again next week for another episode of the lineup on Saturday. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. Oh, and I also wanted to be sure and let you know, listen to The War, as we'll have a special uh, podcast of We Hold These Truths commemorating the anniversary of the American Bill of Rights, so be sure and listen to that. But from Boise, Idaho, uh, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.